Welcome to Introduction to C Programming. Today we are going to talk about File I.O., which is uh, an abbreviation for File Input and Output. <coughs> Files are used for data persistence. This is how we can write out to a disk uh, or to some kind of an external storage uh, outside of main memory. If you remember, uh, in one of our first lectures I went through the memory diagram where we started off inside of the CPU and we had registers that then went to cache from the cache, we went outside of the CPU uh, to the main memory, uh, RAM typically, and then after that we went to the hard drive, which could be a solid state drive or it could be a magnetic disk drive, and then from there we went out to the external storage such as uh, the uh, USB drives, uh, CD-ROMs, DVDs, uh, or even network storage drives. So. Uh, when we talk about file input and output, we're talking about writing a file to a persistent storage, which is uh, hopefully something that when it does not have power, it's still going to persist the data, uh, which is usually beyond the main memory. Main memory needs uh, power so that it can hold the data, but when we get to the disk drives, magnetic or solid state, or we go to an external drive, CDs, DVDs, uh, USB drives, those are going to uh, persist even when there is no power. So that's what we're going to be uh, writing or reading from, writing to or reading from here with the file input and output. Uh, when a file is open in a program, uh, an object is created inside of our code and we have what's called a stream associated with that object. And that stream is what gives us the ability to read or write to that file. In C, if we want to do any kind of file I.O., we have to uh, include the standard I.O.H header file. We typically have already done that because if we want to do any kind of input or output in C, we had already included standard I.O. So there's no additional header files in C that are needed for us to do file input and output. So here's how we can write to a file sequentially. The reason I jump right into code, I have two reasons for it. First of all, uh, I think that we're far enough along in our programming lives that we can start to look at code and even if there's some things we don't understand, we can probably figure out uh, kind of what's going on. We understand functions and variables and pointers and uh, conditional statements and so on. So I think we can kind of figure out what's going on. The second reason is that file I.O. has a very, very big analogy to the same way that we do uh, input and output from the screen. So let's take a look at the code here so we can understand what's going on. On line three, I am creating a file pointer. So there is a variable type called file, all capital letters, and we are gonna create a pointer to a file. So I just said file, the name of the variable, or the type of the variable, followed by the star, and then the name of a variable. In this case, I named it F underscore pointer. That is just the name of a variable, and you could have named that anything that you want, any legal variable identifier. In this case, I've named it F underscore pointer. On line four, I've set that pointer equal to uh, a function. The function is called fopen, and uh, fopen is a function that takes two parameters. You see it takes two char stars, and it is going to return to me a file pointer. So you can kind of figure out what that function does, assuming this code compiles, which it does. Uh, you can see that the fopen function is going to return to us a file pointer, and it takes two, two char stars. The first one, you could probably figure out what it means. That's going to be the name of the file that you would like to write to. So in this case, I'm going to write to a file called output.txt. The second parameter is a W. That stands for uh, writing. This means that we're opening that file for writing. I'll show you some of the other uh, uh, parameters you could pass in as that second variable there. Uh, uh, that means that we could open the file up maybe for reading instead or appending. In this case, we're just opening it for writing. Let me caution you on that line of code right there on line number four. You have now gotten to the point where you have the ability to be dangerous. If you try to open up a file that already exists and you open it for writing, you have just overwritten that file and you will lose everything that is inside of it. So make sure that when you open a file for writing that uh, you're not going to be overwriting something. The location of this file, output.txt, is going to be relative to the location of the executable program. So 
inside of, uh, after you've written this code, it compiles and it compiles down to a .exe file. Wherever that .exe file is located is going to be the directory into which that output.txt file is going to be written. Um, that's generally safe because that exe file is probably not going to be in your Windows slash System32 directory. You probably don't want to do something like that because you have the ability to overwrite those files. Uh, most operating systems are going to protect files that are absolutely essential for the operating system to run. Having said that, I would not put that theory to the test. So don't try to overwrite files that are in the Windows slash System32 directory. Don't try to overwrite files that are in your slash root directory if you're in Windows or if you're in Linux or Mac. Um, you want to make sure that you're writing these probably to a user directory. Of course, you always have the ability and the option to write these files wherever you would like. Instead of passing in a relative file name right here, you could pass in an absolute path name. That would mean that in Windows, I could pass in C colon backslash uh, users slash uh, J Miller slash desktop slash output dot txt. And then it would write that to the C colon users J Miller desktop directory. Uh, and then it would put the file name inside or the file inside of that. So you can write with absolute path names or you could write with relative path names. When you do relative path names, it's going to be relative to the directory that contains the executable file of your program, which is the compiled form of your file. Okay, on line five, I say if f pointer equal equal no, that means that I can't write to the file. Start thinking about what reasons could there be that you wouldn't be able to write to a specific file? Well, there's a couple reasons. One of them could be that you uh, didn't have uh, permissions to write to that file. Maybe it was owned by another user and you were trying to overwrite it. It says, I'm sorry, I can't let you do that. That would be one reason. Uh, chances are this is what would happen if you tried to overwrite one of your operating system files is that it would just say you can't do it because it's protected, it's locked. Um, Another reason would be, I just used the word locked, could be that another program already has that file open for writing. Operating systems typically are going to put locks on files so that not more than one program can write to the same file at the same time. That's generally a good thing so that you're not able to overwrite changes that other people haven't seen because uh, two programs are writing to the same file at the same time. Uh, so that could be another reason. Uh, a third reason, if you're trying to write to a directory and that directory doesn't exist. So if I tried to write to the C colon slash J Miller slash output dot txt file and there's no folder J Miller inside of my C drive, then I would also get in there that I'm not able to write to uh, that file. So there are a few reasons uh, why we could get inside of the if statement on line five. You notice on line seven, I'm saying return because if I can't do that, if I can't write to the file, then what I have down on lines nine, 10, and 11 aren't gonna work. Um, so on line nine, I'm saying f printf. So this looks very, very similar to a printf. And uh, you all are familiar with printf function, the printf function. All I'm doing is I'm putting an f in front of it. It's a completely different function, but it works almost exactly the same way. The difference is that there is one additional parameter. The first parameter in the f printf function is going to be a file pointer. So I say f printf. This means uh, print to a file. And the first parameter of that function is going to be a file pointer. Well, we're in luck. I have a file pointer. It's f underscore ptr. That's my file pointer. Then I put a comma, and after that, everything else uh, following that is just like a printf. So in this case, I just have hello world backslash n inside of my quotation marks. If I wanted to have uh, variables printed out inside of my quotation marks, I could have put percent %s, percent %c, percent %d, percent %f, and so on. I could have formatted with a percent %2f, and then I would just put a comma after the quotation mark and put the name of the variable that I would like to output. So everything after that works exactly the same way as a printf. It's a very nice analogy that the uh, inventors of C came up with so that if you know how to print out to the screen uh, with just a very, very small modification of using the fprintf function and put passing the file pointer as the first parameter into that function, you are now able to write out to files also. Very nice. Line 10, the f flush function. Uh, file writing is actually a very, very inefficient operation on uh, an, in an operating system. The reason for that is because, remember when we had our memory drawing up, that I told you that each level of memory 
had an additional time of about 10 times uh, as long as the previous section of memory. So when we're writing out to a file on a magnetic disk or on an external drive, we're talking about a substantial hit for how long it's going to take to write as opposed to if it was just writing it into a register or writing it into the cache or even into main memory. It's going to take substantially longer to write to a file than it's going to, uh, to write to main memory, let's say. So what the operating system does to try to improve this inefficiency is creates a buffer. And the buffer is stored in main memory, and it's going to store everything that you write out in that fprintf. It's going to store it inside of this buffer until the buffer fills up. The operating system has a buffer of whatever size it may be. It might be as small as 50 bytes, or it could be as large as into the uh, multiple kilobytes. Uh, once the buffer fills up, the operating system is automatically going to flush that buffer and write it out to disk. Now, there is a little bit of a problem that could happen there, uh, is what if your buffer is not yet full, you've written something out and you think it's been written to the file, the buffer is not yet full, and then you have like a power failure, and your computer just dies. Well, unfortunately, if that was still in main memory and had not yet been written to disk, you just lost that data because all of the data that you have in main memory doesn't get written out to disk right away and it doesn't persist through power outages. Um, so if we want, we can write out our data to disk that we put into our file. So on line 9, we put that hello world backslash in into the, the buffer, which is ready to be written, written out to the disk, but we don't know that it's been written out yet or not. If we want to make sure that it gets written immediately, we can call that function fflush, pass in the file pointer, and the operating system is going to flush whatever is in the buffer immediately out to uh, the file. This is... Um, the practice of flushing goes back and forth for whether it's good to or bad to. The operating system is going to flush automatically when uh, the buffer fills up. So you don't want to flush too frequently. If you were flushing after writing each character, then you would see a substantial decrease in performance of your program. On the other hand, you want to make sure, especially if it's something that's mission critical, uh, that you are flushing immediately after writing it. Something in this case right here, you probably could get away with not flushing, and as soon as the buffer filled up, the operating system would flush it to disk, and it would write it all out at that point. Line 11, F close. This is going to uh, close your file. You want to make sure that you close your file, especially if you've opened it up for writing, because you are going to acquire a lock on that file. And if another program tries to open that file, like in Microsoft Word, if you try to open a file that another program already has, it's going to pop up and say, hey, we can open this in read-only mode, but I can't let you modify it. So you want to make sure that you close your file so that you release the lock on that file so other programs are able to operate on it if they need to. When you close a file, uh, the uh, buffer will also be flushed uh, immediately when you close it. So in this case it's a little redundant that I have the flush immediately before the close because the flush is going to be called inside of the close function as well. I did that just to be a little bit more specific for you uh, so that you understand those functions and how they work. Okay, now as I told you on the previous slide, when we call the fopen function, we had that second parameter, which on the previous slide, since we were doing writing, uh, we passed in the uh, w. It's in a string, it's a C string, so it's going to have the quotation marks around it, and I pass in a w. If I want to be able to read from a file, when I call fopen, I'm going to pass in an r instead of a w as that second parameter. Uh, writing is a W, appending is an A. The difference between writing and appending to a file, writing is going to overwrite the file if it already exists. Appending is going to leave the file intact and just write to the end of the file. Uh, so that's the difference between write and append. We have those other three uh, file open modes also, R, B, W, B, A, B. This is specifically if you're going to be reading, writing, or appending to a binary file. So that would be like a, uh, uh, an image or a video. Uh, those would be binary files. And so uh, C actually works very well if you want to do any kind of video editing or um, uh, image editing. Uh, you can do that. You can apply some different uh, algorithms to it. It's pretty neat that you can modify pictures or images that you have on your computer. Uh, of course, writing them to a different 
uh, file so that you're not actually overwriting the original one. But you can change it and put different covers on it. Maybe if you like a, a pink glare or that you can get rid of certain uh, colors if you don't like them in it. And you can do that in scene. Just open it up as a binary file, so an RB, and then you'd be able to read through uh, all of the data in it. Of course, the way that the file is encoded is going to depend on the type of file that it is. So if you are going to try to do something like that, look up what the uh, format of like a JPEG file or uh, a GIF uh, or a BMP, depending on what your file type is, and you can find these are open standards and you can see exactly what the um, uh, format of that file type is, and you would be able to go in and open it, modify it as you will. Uh, kind of a fun little program to write if you want to take uh, a little time on your own uh, to do that. I think that would be a fun project uh, for you to write, and you have the capability of doing it, so it's kind of neat that you can actually write a program which is somewhat useful uh, for modifying some of your video. Maybe you want to make it a little darker or a little lighter, you can do that uh, just by writing a little code, some algorithm for it. Okay, uh, now that we've gone over sequential file writing, our next slide here is on sequential file reading. So if we want to read from a file, uh, it's going to be very similar. You see line 3, I still have to create that file pointer object. Line 4, I'm still calling fopen. Uh, the name of the file is the first parameter, and the second one you probably could have figured out is going to be an R for reading. Uh, as we saw on that previous slide, it's a W for writing, it's an R for reading. Line 5, uh, same idea. So if for some reason I was unable to open that file for reading, then I'm going to get inside of that if statement and then return. So some reasons why we might not be able to open a file for reading could be uh, that the file doesn't exist. That would be a good reason. Uh, we don't have that problem with writing because if the file doesn't exist when we're trying to write to a file, it's just going to create it for us. So we don't have that problem uh, with file writing. With file reading, if the file doesn't exist, it's not going to create an empty file for us and have us try to read it. So instead, it's going to have f pointer come back as null from that uh, f open function. And uh, so that would be one reason. If we don't have permissions to open the file, that would be another one. Don't have permissions to the directory in which the file resides, that would be another reason uh, that we wouldn't be able to uh, open that file. Uh, okay. On line 9, I'm creating an integer that I've named num. On line 10 now, you see that this function is called fscanf instead of just scanf like we read in from the command line. So it's the same analogy that we had with the fprintf uh, on the file writing. So I'm going to call fscanf, and then I pass in the first parameter is going to be my file pointer. The second parameter is going to be what's the type of the variable I would like to read in. In this case, it's a percent %d, an integer. And then the third parameter, in this case, the ampersand num, I'm going to read the first integer from the file into the num variable. That's what that line 10 means, is that I'm not reading from the command line. It's not a scanf, it's an f scanf. So I'm going to be reading from a file. And in this case, I'm saying, well, the first parameter that's inside of that file is going to be an integer, and I'm going to read it into that variable num. On line 11, I'm just showing that this is just a variable num. You can use it just the same way that, as if we had read it in from uh, the command line. So I'm just doing a printf. Printf is going to print it out to the command line. Remember, printf to the command line, f printf is going to go to a file. So I'm just going to print it out to the command line saying, hey, here's the number that I just read from the file, and then print out a percent %d, and that's going to be num. Uh, we don't need to flush when we are doing file reading because we're, there's nothing in the buffer that we need to flush. So we don't use the fflush function here. Instead, we just close it after uh, we're done with it. Again, you want to close it because if you have a file open, other programs uh, may notice that you have a lock on that file and they may not be able to execute uh, the same way as they would if you didn't have a lock on the file. So always make sure that you close your file uh, after you're done using it. So that's line 12 is the f close function and um, I'm passing in my f pointer. So I'm passing my file pointer into it and that's going to be the file then that I close. Okay, our last slide now uh, for today. Uh, I'm showing you here how we can read through a file. We can read through all of the lines that are in a file. So you notice line one looks the same. It's the file pointer declaration. Line two, opening the file for reading. Line three, checking to make sure that I have access to the file, that I was able to open it for reading. Now, line seven, you see it's a while loop, and inside of that I'm calling a function, which is F-E-O-F. That might look a little weird. We don't say it feoff. Uh, what we say is that's the um, for a file, that's the end of file function. So that's what the EOF stands for, is end of file. So what you see 
is I'm saying while not at the end of the file for this file f pointer. So while not f e o f of f pointer, that's a function. F e o f is a function call. It returns to me uh, zero or one. If I'm at the end of the uh, file, then it's going to return to me a one. If I'm not at the end of the file, it's going to return to me uh, a zero. So that's how I'm going to get into that. So if I'm not at the end of the file, it returns to me a zero. I say not zero, and what's not zero? One is not zero. So I'm going to get inside of my while loop. I'm going to read an integer in this case uh, into that variable num. I then print it out to the screen. And uh, I'm just going to continue reading integer after integer after integer until I get to the end of the file. Let me draw up here uh, on the whiteboard for you so that you can see uh, exactly what's going on here. Okay. Make that a little bit bigger. So let's say that we have a file. And my file has two lines in it. Um, let's see, I've got 10 and 20 on the first line, and 30 and 40 on the second line. And then I'm at the end of the file. Now, I'm going to draw in here in a different color. Uh, we have control characters in here also. One control character we have here is the new line character, the backslash n. And right here, uh, at the end, we are going to have a special control character, which is called EOF. All files have that special control character at the end of them. That's the end of file character. So I start off, and I do an F scan F, and I read in the first number. So when I start off, my file pointer is looking right here. And it reads the number 10 into that variable num, and it outputs it to the screen. Then when I read in my next number, that pointer moves, and it's pointing here now at 20. It reads in 20, and it prints it out to the screen. Then I say F scan F on another integer. It's going to skip over the new line character altogether, and my file pointer is going to come down here and point at 30. It's going to read that and print out a 30. It then does the next one. It's going to read out a 40. And then when I say give me the uh, next integer, it's going to come over here and say, uh oh, I'm looking at the end of the file. So what's going to happen is that line 7 is going to return false, uh, and we're not going to get in there. So it's going to print out 10, 20, 30, 40, and then it's going to detect that end of file character, and it's going to break out of that while loop. So uh, this is just a method that I have now read all of the uh, values that are inside of that file, assuming that they all were integers also. Uh, if they all of the values inside of that file are not integers, you're going to have the same problems as if you tried to read an integer from the user and the user typed in the letter J. So you have to make sure that you know what the format of the file is. Before you're opening it up for reading, chances are you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, it might be a good idea to read in strings. Use percent %s because that will read whatever the variable type is and it will read it into a character array or a char star. So that would be the best way to read a file if you don't know uh, what the format of it is. If you know the format, then maybe the first variable is an integer, and the next one's a string, and the next one's a float, and the next one's a character. And if you know that, then you can just read the file in, uh, in that format. Okay, so that's how we do sequential file reading and writing. We have a program for today. Hopefully you all understood that. It's a very, very nice parallel that we have between uh, reading and writing to a file and reading and writing uh, to and from the command line. Uh, hopefully you saw that and this all makes sense. There's just a few additional functions that we have here for file I.O. and it's really nice that they're all inside the standard I.O.H library. Okay, if you have questions, let me know. Good luck.